Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the epistle of the 1st Corinthians, verse by verse. We had a few interruptions, a few pauses, but now we're back uh, into our study of the text. And we're in chapter 7. We crossed over from 6 into 7. As we left chapter 6, and I remind you that there were no chapter divisions, uh, we were looking at what I believe is uh, a teaching concerning our union with Christ and His body, us being members of one another. And I want to say right from the outset, before we even go any further, and we look more intently at chapter 7, that there was no chapter division and that the picture that we're going to be looking at uh, of uh, a the relationship between a husband and a wife uh, is very much a picture of our relationship with Christ, Christ's relationship with His body, the church. If we miss seeing that, then I don't believe that we've really uh, done the text justice I don't think that we've really gained the understanding that the Holy Spirit would have us come to understand about our relationship with Christ, His relationship with us. Uh, we know this from Ephesians. The church is, was a mystery. It was uh, even in in the, the uh, in Romans chapter six and Romans chapter seven. Uh, as we studied through that amazing epistle to the Romans, we saw that we've been married to another, uh, Christ, who's raised from the dead. That uh, We see at the end of chapter 6 that we've been bought with a price, therefore we're to glorify God in our body. Uh, I touched on early on, I did a video, I titled it, uh, I think the title of the video was uh, Christians Who Fornicate which caught a lot of attention. I, I pointed out the, as, this, the various aspects of, of that uh, being not just fornication in the physical sense, but there's sexual immorality uh, within the body, there's sexual immorality, there's fornication, the fornication that's in the body of Christ, which is our being married to Christ while having an affair with the law. If we miss seeing that, then we haven't really, I don't think we've understood uh, where the Holy Spirit, the, the mind of the Holy Spirit in, in chapter 7 is about to take us. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for the opportunity that you give us to feast upon your word together in this very unique format while that we have time while we're here knowing our time is limited knowing that our understanding of your word has its limitations i trust and i pray i know that you will lead us into all truth that you will filter out all of that which is foolish sealing to our hearts only that which is truth for it's in christ's name i pray amen We began at uh, verse 1 in chapter 7. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication. And again, I want to remind you that we're not just looking at a physical aspect of this, but we're looking at the spiritual aspect of this. And as we go through these verses, it's good to keep that in mind. To avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. It's obvious from the text, obvious from verse 2, that being married, uh, uh, it's just a given. It's, it's to be expected. It shouldn't be surprising. We know for a fact that all sexual immorality outside of marriage, infidelity, adultery, 
fornication is wrong. We know that. And God has, has clearly laid that out in, in previous verses. Uh, where I have caught a lot of flack, folks, is people writing to me and saying, uh, and, and I'm, I mean just recently here and writing to me and saying, Steve, you, you really had, did leave. You departed from the context. You know, Paul is talking about Christian marriage. Uh, he's talking about sexual relationships. He's talking about relationships between husband and wife, wife and husband. Even the children are involved in this uh, aspect of this context where the they're either holy or unholy. Uh, the, there's instructions, clear instructions on how a husband is to treat his wife and vice versa. They're not to leave each other and so on and so forth. This is a manual on Christian marriage. It's great for a seminar. You know, great material for a seminar. And of course, you know, videos and articles have been written and published on this and commentaries have been written commentary after commentary after commentary have been written on the physical aspects of all this with, while ignoring the underlying message that the, I believe, and I'm convinced that the Holy Spirit is trying to convey the thought throughout these passages that he, what we're looking at is a picture of Christ and, his church, and the church. But it's obvious, and it should be obvious to just about everyone that to, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. If, if, if we don't, then we're looking at sexual immorality. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. In other words, each one gives the other what is due them, what is their what they are due, what's their, what, their, what, is their, what their right is. It's their right. It's what's due them. It's what, it's what the other is obligated to, to give them because it, it, it belongs to them. It's, it's their due. Now, some of these passages are, are going to be a little difficult to, for me to explain. Uh, I have been involved in some marriage counseling in the past. So many of, thing, of the things that I've sat down with couples and I've said... Uh, didn't go over very well because I probably didn't explain them very well. It's good to keep in mind that this is not Paul's reasoning, not Paul's logic. He did write the epistle, but he's not the author of it. God is, is speaking these words. These are the words of God, not of Paul. I know you're tired probably of hearing that, but I keep pushing and pushing and pushing that, that most important point because if we merely look at this as Paul and his rationality, his reasoning, his logic, then it's easy for people then to say, well, this is outdated. It's, it was 2,000 years ago. This is Paul. This was his opinion. He didn't like women. And you can just go off in whatever, all kinds of directions with that. We're looking at God's Word, and His Word is timeless and eternal. Let the husband render unto the wife what is due her. And likewise also the wife unto the, unto the husband. The wife hath not power. And here I go getting in trouble. But I didn't write this. God did. The wife has not power over her own body, but the husband. And you know as well as I that that is not the, the general mindset today, the popular mindset today. The popular mindset today is this is my body, don't touch it. I have a right to do with, with my body what I, what I will, what I want to, whatever pleases me. And not just my body, but maybe the body growing inside me. That's my, it's my right to do with, with that whatever I want to. And without getting off on some, some really tough rabbit trails there, uh, the fact of the matter is that the wife has not power over her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife, that's verse 4. And 
the text is clearly, without apology, saying that in a marriage between a husband and a wife, if, and I'm just going to be as blunt as I possibly know how because it's the only way I know how to get, get the point across. The context here is sexual relationships, folks. And what God is saying clearly in the text, without argument, without apology, whether we like it or not, whether it fits our modern concept of, of wokeness or, or political correctness or whatever else, the text is clearly saying that the wife does not have power over her own body. And likewise, the, the man, the husband, doesn't have power over his own body. If the woman wants, the wife wants to have sex, the husband is to oblige, and vice versa. Now, I also believe that, because we're looking at not a commandment, but, but something that's a, by concession, as we'll, as we'll go on and read, there are, I'm, I'm certain that there are certain mitigating circumstances whereby there's, there should be some understanding involved in this. But we cannot, we cannot, there's absolutely no way we can get away from the text, from ignore the fact that what the text says is it says the husband has, con has control over his, his body. No. The wife has control authority over her body no it's it's just the opposite it's just the other way around our bodies we were bought with a price folks we're to glorify god in our bodies now i believe that that's the church we're to glorify god in the body of which we are members of christ church but there's a purpose and there's a reason for this, as we're going to find out. The wife has not power of, over, of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other. That can only be talking about sexual relationships. Except it be with consent for a time, the word there, time, it's not chronos, it's not chronological time, it's kairos, it means season, for an agreed upon season or period of time, I don't know whether two weeks, 30 days, whatever, okay? Except it be with consent for a time, and this for a purpose, that's the only reason given, and that is you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, again, once again, we're talking about a sec, we're talking about sex, okay? The most uncomfortable topic I could, that God could possibly put in my lap to talk to you folks about. I'd much rather talk about the breeding of horses or something. Uh, but forgive me if you, if, if, if you think that, that, that I've, in any way put down the, 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 the importance of the text or the wonder and the beauty that's in the text. Folks, there's, there's wonder and there's beauty in this text. Why? Because it, the, the whole entire teaching concerning a, the marriage between a husband and a wife is a picture of Christ and the church. And I was criticized for that in, in a couple of past videos where people would write to me and say, Steve, you just completely left the whole reality of everything on a physical level, the physical plane, the natural, earthly, physical, flesh and blood, you know, reality of the context. And you took that off into some spiritual thing, like you're trying to spiritualize this into something that it has nothing to do with, and I beg to differ. It has everything to do with how Christ deals with, responds to, reacts to the church and vice versa. And how the church lives, acts, responds to God, to Christ. Okay? 
they're to come together again that so that Satan tempts you not. Okay? For your in, incontinency. But, verse 5, I, I speak, or verse 6, I speak this by permission and not of commandment, of concession, Paul is saying. The word there is concession. For I would that all men were even as myself. And now we've got to stop and we've got to go, go back into the history of Paul. We've got to figure out, was Paul married? Was he not married? You know, what did he think of? Did he have a, a wife when he wrote this? Did he have a wife before? Personally, it's, it's hard for me to imagine him not having a wife at one time, being a member of the Sanhedrin. I may have pointed that out in a, in a, in a previous video on this. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. It's, I'm, I'm convinced, absolutely convinced from the text that Paul was married. And, and I, we'll get to that here in a moment. But I would prefer that all men were even as myself. And we're going to see why that is. And uh, clearly, unmistakably, you know, what we're going to find out is, is that there's a reason and in in a purpose for that, and that is undistracted devotion to the Lord. But every man has his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. Verse 7. Every man has his unique, proper, suited, just to him, is what the word proper means, gift of God. One after this. So no wonder he says, I say this, I speak this by permission and not of commandment. We each have given, been given a gift of God. If, if folks, if you've been given the gift of celibacy, if, let me put it this way, if you have not been given the gift of celibacy, don't try to be celibate. And vice versa. If you have been given the gift of celibacy, don't seek to be married. Every man has his proper gift of God. It is a gift of God. I, I, I remember a time where that I, uh, and I may have mentioned this, you know, where I was absolutely convinced that the best course for my life was to be completely devoted to the Lord in the ministry, with no distractions, none whatsoever. Of course, I never could seem to keep animals out of it, you know, as far as having pets and, and animal. I, I'm an animal lover. I love animals. I love horses in particular. I mean, I even love cows, okay? I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm not a big fan of man, like, you know, in the main. I mean, you know, I love the brethren. I love people. I love, I'll do anything I can for anyone, but I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan of man, okay? I do, however, love nature and I love animals, okay, a lot. And a lot of that has kept me from, it's been a distraction of, from my devotion to the Lord and the time that I spend in the Word. But we each have a gift from God. And I found out that my gift was not celibacy, but it was marriage, being married. Verse 8, I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. So obviously, Paul was at one time married. Now, it's interesting. We know a lot about Paul. We know a lot about his rote, his, his, all of his journeys, the shipwrecks, his, the, 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 his conversion on the road to Damascus. We've got a lot of history on Paul. But it's interesting to me, at least I've, I can't help but find it a little bit interesting, that God the Holy Spirit didn't feel the need to put in this passage whether Paul uh, was, was married. 
But the verse, I'm, I'm suggesting that the verse, uh, verse 8, clearly, unmistakably says that he must have been. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. So obviously he had a wife. Did his wife leave him because of his preaching of the gospel? Did his wife leave him for some other reason, whatever reason? We don't know. It is good for them if they abide, abide, and there's that word abide, remain, continue, abide. It's the word is meno in the Greek. Same word as mansions in John 14. But if they cannot contain, that is the word means self-control, if they lack self-control, if they don't have self-control, let them marry. Let them marry. This is what is so wrong with Roman Catholicism's idea of priesthood and celibacy. They've made it a universal, one-size-fits-all, one okay? Every priest should be celibate. And that is not what the text teaches. Each man has received his own gift from God. If the Catholic Church was doing the proper thing, the right thing, when it came to this, they would go to the, they would go to these priests and they would, or the priests themselves ought to read the word and see that each man, each individual man, has his own gift from God. It's not some universal mandate that priests be celibate. And I believe the same thing applies to, 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 to women, nuns. But if they cannot contain, if they cannot actually, if they don't have, if they lack self-control, let them marry, for it's better to marry than to burn. And when I was a little boy, I would read that, and I would go, oh my gosh, that's got to be talking about hell. And of course, we know that's not. Burn with passion. It's, it's better to, to marry than to be frustrated and full of anxiety all the time because you don't have a partner, because you want to be in, involved in a relationship where, which includes a sexual relationship and you and you and you you can't and so therefore you know it's it's but it's better to marry than to burn in verse 10 and unto the married i command yet not i but the lord notice the changes here it's not i but the lord i command yet not i but the lord well steve now wait a minute i thought you said didn't you not say that this is not paul's word it's god's word so therefore even though Paul says, I command yet not I but the Lord, unto the married I command yet not I but the Lord. It, but it, you go down to verse 12 and, and you read, but to the rest speak I, not the Lord. And, and wait a minute, I thought that what, you see, I thought that this was God's word. I thought God's doing the speaking here to the Corinthians. And God is doing the speaking to us. And in verse 12, but to the rest speak I, not the Lord. I don't think that we can, that alters the fact one iota that this is God's word. But God is making concession here. We are not folks under law, but we're under grace. This dispensation that we live in is one of grace in which God is not imputing men's trespasses against them. And so verse 10, And unto the married I command, yet not I but the Lord. This is a commandment from God. We are not under, under law, but this is what God commands. I don't, know how to, I don't know how to explain to you that God can still command that we do something under grace. Just because we're under grace, not law, does not mean that, that 
we're, we're not going to ever see another commandment again. Okay, so we, we get, we've gotten out of the Gospels. We've come through Acts into Romans. And from Romans through Philemon, uh, there should never be any command there given because we're under grace. That makes no sense. Not a lick. Not a lick. Okay? Makes no sense at all. God fulfills what He commands. But it doesn't change the fact that we're not under law. And we're, and we're getting ready to see that. Unto the married I command, yet not I but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. And the husbands, husbands, all you husbands out there now, you, you, you can just jump up and jump down for joy because your wife, she's bound to you as long as you're alive. She never can leave you under any circumstances whatsoever. And if she does, then she's the bad, bad person, bad gal, okay? You're the good guy. She's the bad girl. And uh, she ought to be with you. And if she leaves, you know, you have every right to stomp your feet, jump up and down, get mad because you're on the side of God and she's not. She's not. God has forsaken her. I mean, you know, she's just gone off the deep end. You're the faithful one. She's the unfaithful. That's typically how that goes with all the couple, at least with all the couples that I've talked to. It's easy for the man, for a husband to see, you know, when the husband sees his wife leave him, it's easy for the husband to stomp his foot and say, well, that's not right. You know, God said that was not to be the case. It's true. We're, we're not reading, these words we're reading were, are God's words. I command, yet not I but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband, but, and if she depart, so she's going, she may depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. A heavily, uh, a heavy verse of heavy context on anti-divorce. Okay, that there shouldn't be any divorce. God allowed Israel, God allowed the Jews, Moses, to uh, establish, well, let me, let me just put it this way. God made allowance for divorce in the Old Testament through Moses because of why? What is, what is, what, what is it that we know was the reason? Because of the hardness of their hearts. There's always going to be either both are, are faithful in the relationship or one is faithful or, or one is not or both are unfaithful. That's, that's you know, your only three options. Okay. It is clear from the text that it is not God's desire that the wife depart from her husband. Now if you look at this as I do, which is a picture of Christ in the church. All of this makes perfect sense. But, 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 and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. Why? Because she's still married to him. You can walk away and leave. You can, you can think that you're walking away and leaving the Lord, but you're not. You're still married to him. Yeah. Now, maybe the marriage, actual marriage hadn't occurred yet in heaven, but you're a spouse to Christ. You're His bride. The church is the bride, the body, the very body of Christ, bone of His bone, flesh of His flesh. You can't get away. You can't become unborn again. Okay? You, like the wife, can leave your husband, but you haven't really left him. As long as your husband is alive, you're bound by law to your husband as long as he lives. And, and if he dies, and only if he dies, then are you free to, to be married to another, but only then in the Lord. But and if she depart, verse 11, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. Let not the husband put away his wife. 
I'm, I'm even to this day, I'm astounded at the number of Christians that would even dare suggest that God would take and put away one of his children. Or that he would put away the church. Verse 12, But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother has a wife that believes not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. I don't think that many of these verses need a whole lot of explaining. What I do believe, because you know, we, we can just we can take it as face value. God said it, we believe it, or we don't. But again, and I keep stressing this fact over and over again, this is not just a marry a manual on marriage, okay, or material for a marriage seminar. And the woman which hath a husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. Well, why? Well, verse the next very, very next verse 14 explains it. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. And let's stop right there. Sanctified. We saw at the beginning of this study that we were sanctified set apart for god's purpose for god's use this is what happens in a, in a marriage if one of the spouses whether it's the wife or the husband if one of them is unfaithful or unbelieving and i don't and i and i am not by any means asking you to look at this as as One's a believer, one's a, a, a non-believer. That is, one's a, one's a child of God, one's not a child of God. I don't think that's what the text is saying at all. I think they're both children of God. I think they're both born again. I think they're both elect. I think they are members of God's family. If they're, if they're not, then they shouldn't be together. It's, it's assumed that, that they are joined together in the Lord. They're not unequally yoked. Okay, that they are together, but one is not believing. One is unfaithful. One is not faithful. God has a lot of children that are unfaithful. If the one that's, that's not faithful, for the unfaithful husband is sanctified by the wife, the unfaithful wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. And to me, folks, what the text is saying is it's, is it's saying that any children that come about as a result of that relationship are holy if one of them, just one of them, one, is faithful. I don't see how that you can look at that any, any, way, any way else. Uh, now, I could be wrong about that, but that's how I'm reading that. And as usual, I don't ask anybody to agree with me on anything. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. Let him depart. Don't try to stop him from departing. Let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. Not under bondage. Why? We are not under law, folks. The whole motive, the whole reason why we do anything, the whole reason why we, we please God is not to gain merit with God. It's because we love Him. The, the, the only reason that we do anything for one another is not because of what they can do for us. You know, Christian back-scratching, okay? I'll do this for you if you do this for me. Is because we love Him. We love Him. The only reason I'm talking to you folks is because I love you. It's not for because of what I can get from God by talking to you. Or I can get from you by talking to you. I'm talking to you because I love you. The only reason I stay with my wife is because I love her. That's it. And 
It took me many, many years, folks, to realize, to come to understand that love, what true, what love really is, it is the, the giving of oneself for the ultimate good of another, expecting nothing in return. Well, look, I'm out of time. Uh, we're going to quit right here. Uh, but God has called us to peace. Verse 15. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or, or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? The word is sozo, deliver in the Greek. It's not redeemed. We're not looking at one spouse redeeming the other. Okay? But being involved in a process whereby the other one is delivered. Delivered from what? From sin, self, the law, the world, Satan and even death itself. Please continue to pray for the direction of this ministry as we go forward in these precarious days that we're living in, uh, the days ahead. I pray for you all constantly. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.